Welcome to Security Weekly's Virtual Hacker Summer Camp 2020. I am your host, Matt Alderman, and joining me for this segment again is Dr. Doug White. We're going to talk about how the Twitter hackers got caught. Uh, some interesting uh, investigative techniques here, Doug, on how they ended up catching the Twitter hackers. Yeah, so... Uh... <laughs> It was pretty good detective work. I, I really liked that part of it because I felt like when I saw that, that's actually pretty smart. And some of it's just straight up good hacking, OSINT, Intel kind of stuff. Uh, there's three people that, that have been indicted. I don't know if all of them have been arrested. Uh, Nima Fazelli of Orlando, Florida is 22, what I, I believe arrested. Uh, Mason John Shepard, who's from the United Kingdom, is 19, was also indicted. And supposedly the mastermind behind this was uh, Graham Clark of Tampa, who's 17. And basically, if you've been under a, a Twitter rock for a while, uh, what these uh, people did supposedly was, was Graham Clark was advertising on uh, OG users that he could... Um, he could give away, he could get you access to any Twitter account. And they targeted 130 accounts and they changed the passwords on about 45. And I'm going to sort of kind of fast so we can talk about the other more interesting part. But basically, um, they were using Discord, they were using uh, t uh, Twitter, and they were using the OG users forum to uh, exchange information. And so basically, uh, they got caught. <laughs> and, uh, they, they ran out a Bitcoin scam using high profile Twitter accounts like Barack Obama, uh, and, and Elon Musk, uh, et cetera, Bill Gates. There was a whole pile of them that they used. And uh, supposedly they netted something like $200,000 worth of Bitcoin through that. The detective work then behind this about how they got caught was um, they started looking, uh, the FBI was looking at essentially uh, some breach information. So OGusers.com, which is a hacking forum where people trade social media information, had a breach earlier this year. Uh, they, they went on and they got access to this breach information, I presume, on some dark website that was hosting it or selling it. And basically, when they got into that uh, OG user data, they found an email address that was provided by a user named Rolex to a user named Kirk. And the, the actual name is Rolex uh, pound 0373 and Kirk pound 5270. And basically what happened was they, they traced that, that connected those two people on Discord. So there was a Discord exchange that they got access to where uh, Kirk was offering to, that he could access anything at Twitter on the God panel and that he was a Twitter employee. And Rolex, who uh, is, is this uh, Fazelli person, uh, basically said, uh, prove it. And then uh, Kirk turns around and says, give me your Twitter handle and I will. And so apparently he did. So once they had that information, it got kind of interesting. Um, basically, they were looking at the, the information on Discord and this uh, gleaned information from OG users. And they ended up tying that to Coinbase. So once they had a Coinbase Bitcoin account, the FBI actually went to Coinbase and researched this Bitcoin address. This was with a warrant, I presume. And Coinbase, and this is the part that I thought was very interesting, Coinbase, per SEC rules, requires a user ID and other information to identify someone before they create an account. And they found an account named NIMF. And basically, once they knew that account name that was on the Bitcoin account, they were able to pull the driver's license file. And that gave them uh, Fazelli's home address in Orlando and his age. And then to get Shepard, who was another person who had been involved in this uh, on OG users, advertising that they would uh, provide you with access to any Twitter account, they used the same tactic and found out that he also had a Coinbase account. And they got the information again from the OG user breach. 
went back to Coinbase, got his driver's license in the UK, and got his address and so forth. They did not, in the released court documents so far, explain how they tied Clark into this. But supposedly at this point in time, um, basically uh, Clark has admitted to some of this. Uh, he supposedly has over $3 million worth of Bitcoin, but his lawyer said that all that was obtained legally. I mean, 17 year old with 3 million of Bitcoin must be legal, but hey, who knows? So uh, right now uh, it looks like everybody's been indicted and uh, is possibly all of them are in custody. I'm not sure, at least some of them are. What I thought was interesting about this is the Coinbase piece, because uh -huh. If you think about it, you know, you think about Bitcoin having a level of privacy associated with it. It's anonymous, right? But the problem I think here for these attackers is they were using Coinbase to take the Bitcoin and turn it into actual money. And because Coinbase falls under financial regulations, in this case by the SEC, things like know your customer and any money laundering regulations kick in, which means you have to give them valid information to create those accounts. So I think the mistake here for them was they tried to turn the Bitcoin into actual cash. That's ultimately probably what got them caught. It, uh, that would be, I mean, that seems to be what got them caught because they actually were able to get this SEC mandated information from Coinbase. So yeah, so it wasn't the Bitcoin that revealed who they were because that is anonymous. It was the fact that Bitcoin in and of itself doesn't have that much value because you can't go buy a Maserati with Bitcoin, at least that I know of in the United States. Maybe you can somewhere, but you know, if you're 17 and you've got $3 million worth of Bitcoin and you want to go buy a Maserati, you're going to have to actually convert that to cold hard cash at some point. And when they do that, they have to actually uh, open an account with an exchange. And that's also how you buy Bitcoin in the United States is you have to open an account with an exchange. Now, if they would have used the Bitcoin and been able to use the Bitcoins to buy something with Bitcoins and not have to go to the exchange, they probably would not have gotten caught or potentially not gotten caught. I mean, there was other forensics components here. Yeah. But if you think about it, if, if they would have left it at Bitcoin and maybe used the dark web to use that Bitcoin to buy other things that they could have used, like maybe credit card numbers, for example, on the dark web, use Bitcoins, then use the, the fraudulent credit card, you know, the, the stolen credit card numbers to then monetize it. It probably would have been a little harder to actually find these guys because it's only been a couple of weeks, I think, since since the attack. Well, yeah, and, and there doesn't necessarily have to be any information on Discord or on OG users that would tie you to any particular person. And a lot of that's probably pretty defensible because they were using handles and, e and there were emails. So one of the one of the cases was they are part of this for this Fazelli guy was that they got an email address that he had used for PayPal on OG users. So this, the, the real reason that they got caught really was probably because of this OG users breach, because at some point they had to get a warrant to go to Coinbase because Coinbase probably wouldn't give that information. I don't know, though. I don't know what the legality of that is with financial institutions, but they'd almost have to have a warrant to go to Coinbase and say, give us this driver's license information. So, but yeah, the Coinbase was where they got caught. Uh, everything else was fairly nebulous. They were just tying email addresses to user handles and so forth on Discord and OG users. But then when they could take that back and get a warrant to go to Coinbase, that's where they got them. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. We talk about a lot of breaches and we talk about the dark web and, and a lot of the transactions that happen there that are hard to trace and track because some of the a lot of anonymity there. Um, in the one mistake is when you turn that anonymous user into an actual uh, person, uh, like in the in, in the exchange, is, is seems to be the little trap there. So I thought yeah. it was. I mean, that was where it, yeah, they got tripped up, and they're all probably going to jail. And it's they haven't revealed yet what I, I don't think they've revealed all the charges against Mr. Clark at this point. But uh, they said that uh, Mr. Shepard in the UK was facing 45 years in uh, in prison 
and uh, and Fazelli in the United States had a statutory maximum of five years in prison uh, based on uh, what they were doing. But uh, so I'm guessing Clark's going to get a lot more charges dumped on him and they're probably getting him to try to plea out to, you know, limit what they charge him with. Yeah, Uh, I I think I read somewhere something that his bail. So Clark's bail was set at seven hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah. But I mean, he's got three million in Bitcoin. Yeah. Well, but he's got to convert it. (laughs) Yeah. But if it's legal, I guess they're trying to prevent them from freezing that. So. I don't know how you could freeze Bitcoin, but if, you know, or even if you can prove that he has it, it was just, and I don't have any idea why he was telling them, but from having interviewed some criminals in in my life, um, sometimes people just start talking and bragging and who knows. So now they're probably trying to figure out how to get hold of the $3 million worth of Bitcoin if they can show that he obtained that illegally somehow or hadn't paid taxes on it. Um, you and I were talking earlier about, you know, offshore accounts and things. So, you know, if you've got that money stashed in Bitcoin somewhere, turning around and saying, oh, yeah, and I got three million in Bitcoin, you know, bitches, then, you know, then they start looking for it. But uh, it could well be hard to get. Could be. I mean, I, I thought you were going to try to open an offshore account during the break. So I, I don't know if you were successful or not. If I was willing to hand five hundred dollars to these guys, I did find a site uh, that would would allow me. It, it's got a green check mark on it that says your investment is guaranteed protected, um, and it says no ID required, and uh, that you don't have to go there in person. And they will open you an account offshore that you can access via a variety of means, including Bitcoin. Uh, with no ID. So uh, I started to open one, but then I started thinking, or I could spend $500 on cigars and uh, and not worry about that green check mark just being a green check mark. Yeah, I'm not quite sure I trust them to safely store my money if I were going to send it over there. It doesn't sound like there's a lot of checks and balances if you don't even there, need an ID to open the account. Their fact says they, that you're, you, there's no way you can lose your money. Okay. Well, I'll believe it when I see it, and I don't think I'm going to do it anytime soon. So beware, yeah. hackers, right? If you're going to use an exchange to try to convert your Bitcoin into actual cash, you're probably going to get caught. At least in the United States. Now, I will say that uh, that what we're talking about is an SEC rule in the United States that applies to financial institutions. Other countries have similar rules, but not all of them do. So if there is a way to manage Bitcoin uh, offshore, uh, people may be able to maintain that level of anonymity. But again, once you start moving money around in countries that have no rules, no regs, and you're saying, I want to be totally anonymous, but I'm going to give you all my money, that gets a little scary because if I give my $3 million in Bitcoin to some guy named Sid in another country, And I never even, you know, they don't even know who I am. I'm not sure how I get my money back. It starts to sound a little snaky to me if they just take all my Bitcoin and say, well, thank you for those Bitcoin hashes. Have a nice day. We'll protect them for you. Green check mark. Green check mark. Well, I think the FBI did a great job here. Great forensics work to find them and and did it pretty quickly. Like I said, it's it's only been a couple of weeks. You know, the the hack was all over the news. And and here we are two weeks later with them caught. They're still debriefing Clark. And, and, you know, I would say he's going to have to plead to a whole bunch of nasty stuff. And, uh, you know, he messed with a bunch of big shots and celebrities and uh, they don't take kindly to that. Yeah, exactly. Doug, thank you for joining me for this segment. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. Uh, We'll come back tomorrow with more interviews and more news on Virtual Hacker Summer Camp.